Members of City Council, please attend the call meeting at the City Council to be held in the 6th floor conference room, 801 Crawford Street, 5 p.m. Tuesday, December 13, 2016, for the purpose of a public work session. In addition, you may consider a motion to go into closed meeting by order of the mayor. Mr. Cherry? Here. Dr. Edmonds? Mr. Meeks? Oh, Scott, sorry. Mr. Moody? Here. Ms. Simmons? Here. Dr. Whitaker? Here. Mayor Wright? Here. Dr. Patton. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of City Council. Our first presentation this evening is the 2016 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for fiscal year ending June 30th, 2016. The report contains numerous financial statements and notes, cumulative information, including the city's net position and fund balance, along with budget results and statistical information. An audit by a qualified independent audit firm is required by the Commonwealth of Virginia and to comply with bond covenants. Cherry Beckett, the city's external auditor, will have Mrs. Krista Edaw, who is an audit partner with the firm, present the city's audit results. Over the past six months, our finance department staff has worked tirelessly and diligently with the audit team to provide detailed information, answer questions, and provide financial data in developing this report. I want to take this opportunity to thank Mrs. Alice Kelly and the entire financial team for their contributions to this most important financial report. The second presentation, as we approach the end of 2016, I have asked Chief Chapman to provide a summary of the city's policing strategies that's creating significant reductions in some areas of violence and crime in our city. Although the final statistical policing data will not be available until the end of the year, I think it's important to give you the members of city council and our citizens a glimpse of the significant policing engagement we are involved in across the city. Mrs. Edoff. Good evening, Mayor, evening. Vice Mayor, uh, members of council, and S Madam City Manager, and all others present tonight. I am pleased to be here with you tonight to report the results of the June 30, 2016 audit. So we were engaged to audit not only the financial statements but also of the city, but also of the school board, the Economic Development Authority, and the Port and Industrial Commission, which are included in separate columns within those financial statements. In addition to an audit just of the financial statements themselves, we are required to conduct an audit over non-compliance with specific state laws and regulations, as well as compliance with federal grants, also known as a single audit. So in conducting our audit, an audit of the financial statement says, we tested the significant balances and transactions that you see within those financial statements. Um, in Performing our audit, we are required to gain an understanding of the internal control environment um, across the city. And in doing so, um, it's really to help us in the design of our audit. We do not issue a separate report specifically on internal controls. However, if matters were to come to our attention um, that rise to a significant deficiency internal controls, we would be required to report those to you. In addition, in our testing of compliance matters, if any matters of non-compliance come about, we're also required to report those to you. Um, any matters of internal control or non-compliance are included in the back of our report in a separate schedule of findings and question costs. Um, one thing I do want to point out in our financial statements this year, if there was anything that impacted the comparability 
if you took this year's financial statements and compared it to last year, um, we would be required to report that to you. Um, and it's referenced in the footnote. So the city did identify that there was an error in previously reported financial statements, and they did go ahead and correct that and restate the prior years. So we do want to point that out. It is included in our audit report. It doesn't impact our audit report, but we do want to address to your attention if you tried to compare current year to prior year, those differences would come about. So as a result of our audit, we did have a clean opinion, also called an unmodified opinion on those financial statements, as well as the reports on compliance with state laws and regulations and on the report for compliance with federal grants. So the city did a good job, got the clean opinions on all three of those reports. There were, as I mentioned, some restatements to the prior year that we consider um, a deficiency in internal control. Those are reported in detail in the schedule of findings and question costs. As well, when we performed our compliance testing over the state laws and regulations, we also identified two areas of non-compliance, both pretty common findings um, across the state of Virginia at other localities. The one I do want to point out to you as a city council because part of it is your responsibility to timely file those conflicts of interest statements. So if any board member doesn't turn those in and file timely both at the December 15th and June 15th filing, um, it does show up as findings in the city's financial statements. So just want to remind you of your responsibility for those areas and they are due here in um, just two days. So. Now that's the result of our audit opinions. When we conduct our audit, there could be some additional information where in the performance of our audit that we would like ultimately um, to relate to you. So if there were any changes in accounting standards or any changes in accounting policies, we would report those to you because again, ultimately it would impact potentially the comparability if you tried to look at this year's financial statements versus last year. So there were no changes in either significant accounting standards or accounting policies used by the city. Built into the financial statements that you see, there are some items that we consider to be significant estimates. And any change in management's judgment in um, considering those estimates ultimately could change the number that's presented in the financial statements. Now, management does analyze those estimates every year, and ultimately, again, those numbers are changed. Sometimes could be pretty significantly if there were changes in those underlying assumptions. Um, the most common, the biggest, most significant estimates within those statements relate to the allowance for doubtful accounts on taxes receivable, as ultimately they're an estimate based on historical collections of taxes. The depreciation expense is a significant estimate because it's based on the estimated useful life of the assets held by the city. And then lastly, any actuarially computed liabilities, the largest one being the pension liabilities, as those are computed by an actuary with some significant underlying assumptions, the largest one being the mortality rates, so how long employees are going to live after retirement to receive those benefits. So again, pretty substantial estimates built into the financial statements that again, any changes in those assumptions could ultimately impact the numbers. If we had any disagreements with management, if we had any difficulties in conducting the audit, or if management were to significantly consult with another CPA firm on matters, we would be required to report those to you. Um, we did not identify any of those matters. We did not have any disagreements with management, and we didn't have any difficulties conducting our audit. If in conducting the audit we were to identify any misstatements and propose any audit adjustments, we would report that to you. I'm pleased to tell you that we did not propose any audit adjustments to make the financial <coughs> statements materially correct. 
at the end of an audit, we do require management to sign a letter of representation telling us that the financial statements that you receive are correct and accurate and that they provided us all of the information that we asked for, all of the information that was available and that was needed in the conduct of the audit. And management did provide us with that representation. Um, just to kind of let you know of some standards that will be coming up and effective um, roughly two years from now. If you'll recall last year, that large pension liability came onto the face of the financial statements. Well, in two years from now, the Accounting Standards Board is going to make the same thing effective for any other post-employment benefits, which really is your retiree's health care. Now, that information is already disclosed in the financial statements, and it's included in required supplementary information. It'll just now come onto the face of your statement of net position. So that's the biggest change that's coming up that you'll see um, effective in the future. Um, with that, that's really the result of our audit, and I'll be glad to take any questions that you might have. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Edolph. Any questions for her? Right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Edolph. Thank you. Chief Chapman. Mayor Wright, Vice Mayor Simmons, members of City Council, Dr. Patton. It is truly an honor for me to be here once again before you to discuss some of our, our building trust and violent crime um, reduction strategies that um, have taken place since I've been here, as you all know. Um, I arrived on February 22nd, so we have been working diligently to try and have some crime reversal strategies put into place. So myself and my staff, we've met with federal, state, and city um, officials, civic league, citizens, faith leaders, churches, business leaders. We've been all over the city for the past nine months um, trying to get um, better engagement from the community. Um, I've held uh, chief's forums almost every month, a couple months, um, due to different circumstances, homicides or the trial. We had to postpone the forums for other initiatives. Um, We've engaged in our community walk and talk, which we call our CEO, our community engagement opportunity, um, where Dr. Patton and the department heads have joined the police department and walking in their neighborhoods. Um, we've covered Port Norfolk, Craddock, Cavalier Manor, Swanson Homes, Prentice Park, and Prentice Place. And according to Ms. Hogue, we visited approximately 149 homes um, all over the summer months, or from the spring through October will pick back up in the spring of next year. Um, so we've um, engaged the community as well as, you know, talked to about their issues and concerns and trying to address each of those um, community problems. And as you know, most of the time it's not a police issue, so that's why we've engaged other departments uh, to come out and participate as well. We also held a um, police and community trust building event this summer. It's called PAC. It's um, put on by DOJ. So we worked in partnership with the Department of Justice. Um, we had about 80 participants from all walks of life, the young, the old, the elderly, the, our seniors. <laughs> um, we've had uh, faith leaders, nonprofit, different advocacy groups. So about 80 individuals participated in that um, function. From that group, about 16 individuals were selected to form a coalition because as a result um, we came up with the top issues that are barriers to trust in the community and so the purpose of the group going forward was to try and address some of those issues I can tell you over the past couple of months participation um, had drastically dropped we were only getting five members um, from the group so we're going to revamp that re uh, assess whether that's working and it, it doesn't appear to be so we're going to move forward on some other initiative trying to um, rectify um, some of those barriers um, between the community. So. Oh, 
and just you don't have to back up. But we also established a peer leaders focus group um, within the police department to try and find out internally what issues and concerns they're having. We're actually having our first meeting next week um, with the officers. It's about uh, 20, uh, 24 officers um, that'll meet with me and talk about internal issues within the police department. And so we get to our violence reduction strategies. And as you know, I spoke to you all back in April about changing to geographical policing, which we were very successful of. I'll show you more um, on speak more about that shortly. Um, last September, we formed a street crimes unit. Once again, I'll speak to you mo more in depth um, on another slide. But we started a violent crimes task force last April. Um, Dr. Patton gave us authorization to use overtime to address some of um, the crime that was going on in the city. Um, and I have a separate slide on that to talk about their results um, as well. Uh, another uh, response we had was to a homicide. I now have my gang and narcotics units responding out to a homicide because most of the time it's either drug related or um, gang related. So they are now working closely with my homicide unit to try and um, build leads and try and um, solve the crimes. We have our violence and crime reversal initial, initiative um, with Old Dominion University, and they're currently working on um, surveys, but we've supplied them crime stats for the city, and Dr. Patton can speak more in depth if you're interested in that initiative. Um, we established a Faiths Behind the Badge Coalition. We had our first meeting about a month, a month and a half ago, and we had um, about 40, 30 to 40 um, pastors throughout the city attend. Um, and the the purpose of that is to try and build a partnership with the faith commun community to be another advocate for the police department before a violent incident occurs and try and help build trust through the faith um, community. Um, so that um, was off to a good start. We hope to have more participation in that as well. Um, I established a Young Adult Police Chiefs Commission. And our first meeting was about a month, month and a half ago, um, with a group of young students, um, grades 10 through 12. Um, there are 12 currently, and we are open to more. They just didn't have, more were interested, they just didn't get the field trips back in time, the field trip slips um, from their parents. But the whole purpose in that is, one, to engage the community to build those partnerships for them to be advocates for the police department, but more importantly for us to help mentor them, help guide them um, in their career choices, whether it's a trade, whether it's college or um, military, you know, and we'll um, work with them each month to try and, you know, steer them in the right direction um, after high school. Um, we reinstituted our PAL program, which is our Police Athletic League. Um, we currently have three different groups. We have a group of cheerleaders, and we have almost 30 participants in that from ages 5 to 18. We have uh, a basketball program. Um, we have about six part participants in that. And we have a boxing program with six participants. So once again, trying to engage the youth um, prior to them getting into having idle hands and getting into you know bad situations um, and once again trying to develop those positive relationships with the police department. We also um, partnered with Parks and Recs to start the Nighthawk basketball program that started um, back in September. It was on a trial basis and because we've had 40 to 50 participants each Friday and Saturday night, with, yes, the first night it opened, it's, it was 50 plus individuals in there and it's been consistent um, every Friday and Saturday. So we continue the program. Um, we have the funding through at least July right now to pay the officers and um, to make sure the program is run safely. Um, but that has been a huge success for us as ages 17 to 28. It's from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. every Friday and Saturday night. Um, so that's been a good program. We continued our coffee with a cop going around the city. We added an extra flair to it in the sense that we went to TCC and it became a recruitment tool. And they brought out their whole classes of crime, I mean, uh, public safety classes, actually a welding class, and individuals were interested in coming to take a test. And, you know, just to watch them first see the police and not want to come out, and then they would see their friend. And so more and more started coming out. So that turned out to be um, a great program as well. 
well. We started a Coloring with a Cop program um, for the little, the preschoolers. And we started at TCC. We did a autistic class last month at West Haven. So the kids loved just sitting there and coloring with the cops. Um, and we um, started the rapid engagement of support in the event of trauma. And that's our reset program. And that's whenever there is a critical incident such as a homicide, we go out as soon as practical to try and heal that community. We partner with behavioral health as well as our chaplains. And for those who want prayer, the chaplains are there to pray. Behavioral health gives out pamphlets for any mental health services. But the key is want to try and heal the community, but to try and find out the root cause of the problem. What happened, what led to um, that individual homicide or critical incident, and try and repair that so we don't have to respond um, back again. And this goes back to our geographical policing model. We divided the city into three areas. And mainly to create consistency for our officer assignments um, and foster the familiarity with the areas for the officers that they're assigned and build community goodwill and trust um, in those areas with the businesses as well as um, your leaders. And then more of our violent uh, reduction strategies. What we did was our NAOs, most of you know them as our neighborhood impact officers. We changed the names to community engagement officers um, and restructured the unit. Um, we still have five CEOs, or our community enhancement officers, two per district, except for the church in our area has one. But now we have a street crimes unit which has eight officers. Um, and that was mainly to address the violence address the, the robberies we were having, um, the homicides in the area, the drug dealing. I, I can tell you back in March when I was driven around and to see so many open air drug markets um, in the neighborhoods that hadn't been addressed. So those units were put there to try and address that. We started a homeless outreach team, which we call our hot team. And there, it's two officers, mainly downtown, trying to address the homeless issues. Um, and like I said, we started the PAL. We're continuing Safety Town. We have our Citizens Academy um, every year. The, first, the next one will be this coming March. And I've already talked about the Young Adult Police Chiefs Commission, which is YAPCC, and the face behind the badge. And then this is how we divided up the city. Um, you had District 1 here, District 2, and District 3. They're natural boundaries um, between the highway and uh, the river. And so just, just a refresher of what we did back then. And then you get into our crime stats. Our crime stats, if you notice, this is overall part one offenses. So we have violent crime, property crimes, and total incidents. Um, and although we're still up overall for the year, when we started our street crimes unit back in September, that's when they went into effect, you can notice the drop in crime that's been consistent for, for the past three months. So we believe it's been an effective tool, although we can't take credit for it all, but we think it is making an impact. Um, our property crime, it's also coming down um, over the past um, several months. And I can tell you that because we changed our, what we call ComStat, where they, the um, district lieutenants are responsible for each district, and they have to report out what the crime areas are and where the hot spots are. The individual officers and detectives can now focus on that particular location, and they're providing information each month on who the suspects are, who we should be looking for. I can tell you with the property crimes, our burglaries and our um, our larceny from autos and grand larceny autos, they're mainly juveniles. The problem is we have, we'll lock them up and then they'll be back out the next day and they're doing the same thing. But we know who they are. So the officers now have photos of this is the suspect and when they're out in those areas, you know, you have a reason to stop them and um, move forward. So um, you can go to the next one. And this is our year to date. And when I say year to date, the date stops in um, November. It's always a month behind. So the stats you have here are up to November. And as a, in November, we only had 10 homicides 
compared to 21 at that time last year. As you all know, we had 27 total. Since this report, we've had two more homicides, one this past Sunday and the one the Sunday before last. So we're still um, under 50% or over 50% with our homicides, so we're going to pray that we will um, keep it maintained. But what's really spiking our numbers for violent crime, although we're down 52% here, was our sexual assaults. The numbers are low, they're very low, but because they're so low, you show huge spikes. Like you went from eight to one, so it's a 700%. So they're driving a lot of the violent crime numbers. Um, and our robberies, once again, if you see from September down, because we're targeting those areas, um, the crime has um, been reducing all along and aggravated assaults as well. And then these are your property crimes, your burglary. Um, the whole region pretty much had a spike in burglaries last month, whether it's the holiday season. Um, Chesapeake was just on the air, but we're focusing on, like I said, those individuals, those juveniles, we're catching them. So we've been very successful lately in catching individuals. As a matter of fact, the ones that Chesapeake just spoke about, we caught them in Portsmouth um, for after a pursuit. But it was their individuals we caught in Portsmouth. Um, so once again, large knees, we're bringing it down. Um, and motor vehicle theft has, was really high this year, so it's coming down as well. Um, we still have some work to do. Go ahead. What's the difference between burglary and larceny? A burglary is someone's dwelling. If you went into someone's house, a larceny could be a larceny from a motor vehicle, any kind, it could be Walmart, it could be shoplifting, just, you know. If you steal it from a person, it's a robbery, so. And then these are our part one offenses with our arrest so far. Like when I said, we had 11 last week before I did the chart, now we have 12. But at that time, we've arrested six of those individuals. We have suspects and um, the others. I think it's two or three that we do not have any leads on, but uh, they are working hard at those. And these are just some of the other numbers um, for the actual arrest that we have been making. And then Dr. Patton asked me just to do a brief synopsis on all the deaths we've had. So fatalities, we've had six. Suicide, we had another one over the weekend, so we actually had 13. And then the homicides, non-negligent manslaughter is now up to 12. Overdoses is key because there, although there have only been five deaths from overdoses, there were 137 reported. And we, we've started a Narcan program, the Naloxone, which those are the ones that we've saved, um, where the fire department has saved them, and now the officers are in the process of being trained to carry the naloxone or the Narcan. Um, so they just, it's a mist. They just spray it, and then the person hopefully will be revived and save more individuals. I'm back. And then our Violent Crime Task Force. Um, this is the results of their efforts. Like I said, they started back in February, so, I mean, in April. So we've had 59 arrests from them, 222 misdemeanor arrests, field observations, 448, 488. Um, directed patrols, which means they've targeted certain areas over 1,000 times, summonses, 63. We recovered 14 firearms, 117 grams of <coughs> marijuana, 22 grams of heroin, five grams or six grams of cocaine, three stolen vehicles, and $1,800 cash. So, that's all. Does anyone have any questions? Well, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Chief, good, good report. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Churchland area, you mentioned that uh, they only have one uh, uh, CEO. Is, is, that, uh, is that in the process of uh, going to be filled? No, it was only one designated because of the number of calls for service out there. It wasn't a need to have multiple CEOs out there. So it's based on previous calls for service? Correct. Not calls, the nature. Uh, area? Right. So. Hmm. Okay. So. <laughs> Well, ho you, ho hopefully that, uh, since it has fewer calls for service, obviously that's a good thing. But that's the only area with uh, only one. 
Is that correct? That, that's correct. I mean, there are more officers out there. There are officers assigned. It's just one assigned to the community. And that's mainly looking at quality of life issues. And But the key is they can utilize the resources. If they need the street crimes unit, they can come out there. If they need the homeless team, they will come out there. So every month when we look at comps that we see what the issues are, and then the department is their resource. So that one person is not alone <coughs> out there. It's whatever resources they need, they will have someone there to assist. Okay. Uh, ho hopefully we can maybe revisit that uh, okay. uh, because that, I think that community engagement piece is important for the Churchland area as well. And I know Long Point and some other areas have had uh, uh, some uh, break-ins and what have you. and. Uh, automobile break-ins as well as uh, home invasions. Yes, and that's absolutely right. And that's where I said when we see that um, prior to it happening or when it happens, that's why we direct our resources out there. So you, you have to look at the neighborhood impact officer or the CEOs as just a conduit to um, the partnership. Just I, This is my contact but I still have the department as my resource. Right. So they, they're just contacting all the civic associations, going to the civic meetings, trying to find out what the issues and concerns are. Then the entire department is responsible for addressing those issues. Like I said, we had break-ins in Sterling Point, that whole area up there. All of our resources were out there for a couple months. So it's not just that one officer. So don't look at it as a one Person. No, I'm, I'm not looking at it that way, but when, when resources are available, I'd like to see Churson have a, two CEOs as well. Yes, sir. Thanks. And it, yeah, Dr. Water. Yes, Chief. Uh, have you noticed um, in the time you've been here um, a cyclical nature in the crime? I, I noticed here you have a five year average. Uh, have you been able to look at whether this is part of a, a cycle? we're just going through as other areas? I have not looked at it per se for this um, time period, but we'll look at it once the year ends mm -hmm. um, and we do the five-year weighted average to see where it is, but I haven't looked at it at this point. All right. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. <coughs> Mayor, did, um, <coughs> Chief said that we would give additional fact. Did you want any other information on our partnership with ODU? Yeah, if we could um, get a brief. I just me. just brief. Um, <coughs> it was December twenty eighth of last year that we hosted uh, the Balance and Crime Reversal press conference, mm -hmm. and as a result of that press conference, it was a uh, in the month of January or February where Dr. Whitaker. Uh, recommended that you know we just not approach this from press conference and nothing changes. He suggested that we um, engage um, the uh, Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice, uh, which is noted across the country for working and addressing crime prevention and intervention initiatives. So we started working with them immediately. Um, and when I say we, it's both the city and the schools. Um, we have uh, hosted um, a, a summit, which we had probably about um, about 50 people to attend. You were you came out. From there, they are presently um, developing all of the. Um, They've, they've gathered all of the 2015 uh, existing data sources, which deals with cens census, police data, schools, um, and um, any kind of data that can help them to begin to look at mapping both the neighborhoods, both the schools, uh, both civic leagues, uh, with the overlay of where there are uh, issues relating to crime. And then we'll be able, as they go forward, to identify what are those criminal logistic, uh, eight criminal logistic uh, um, initiatives that are, that are significant in uh, a neighborhood. According to Dr. Sumter and her team, she said there are very few neighborhoods in the country that all eight are in one neighborhood. But when you know what some of those things are, unemployment, drugs, uh, you know, um, uh, high poverty, those are the kinds of things that would tell us, here's what we need to be focusing our attention 
on in those neighborhoods. Um, right now, they are finishing the survey. They work with uh, Civic Leagues, for the Civic Leagues. Uh, Dr. Bracey and I tomorrow will meet on the school uh, data survey that high school students will take. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, um, we will continue. Uh, <coughs> this will be a year effort of us working with them, continuing, uh, and we'll continue to keep council updated. But uh, it is making a difference from police to all of us working together. Okay, very okay. good, thank you. All right. Yeah, Dr. Wood. Um I, I hope that as, as we partner with the academy that, that we understand that the approach to crime is, is not this approach that we just off the top of our heads um, suggest remedies. I, I know that there's this constant discussion about uh, increasing police and um, th there's no correlation in research that shows the more police you have, there's a reduction in crime. And so I'm hoping that from, from this endeavor, uh, Dr. Patton, that, yes. that we will approach this uh, from a scientific approach and not um, this off the <coughs> top of our heads and just emotionally reacting um, to, to crime. That's why I was asking the chief earlier about whether this is a cycle mm -hmm. um, because <coughs> the, the sociology, criminologists, they, they've studied this stuff. They know that there are pockets and patterns. And so I'm, I'm hoping that we will be able to apply um, research-based strategies um, and not just emotional uh, reactions to um, the crime that we're seeing uh, across the country that is well-documented, studied, and that has practical approaches. And so I'm hoping we will uh, continue to implement that. That's exactly what we're doing. And the team at ODU almost speaks identical your words. Um, it, 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 we must go in depth and deal with what the true <coughs> issues are and um, bring those issues before our elected leadership to let them know here, here is what our issues are and, and, and come with some strategies from the team and from the universe to say here are some things we can do and then from there with you all's direction we can continue to move forward. We are hoping to have our first uh, report um, by December the 19th. That's the time for our first report. And we'll make that available to you. And that's the work that they have done so far. And that's just beginning with the surveys and things and engagement. But more will be coming. And I think we'll, uh, and I think the chief may have uh, mentioned it during her presentation. You'll find that a lot of these things are not truly police. <laughs> and it's, it, there are issues that, in our society that, that, that we're not addressing, that's spewing over, that causes the police to be the, 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 the line of defense. And so hopefully collecting that data and doing those types of things will be able to allow us to deploy the right assets throughout the city yes. and not just, right. as Dr. Whitaker mentioned, do some reaction of going and hiring a bunch of people just doing something just for political purposes and all because I think a lot of that and I think when we talked in the first summit they talked about that even the issues with the kids in school and the patterns and the behaviors in the school and most of those things are coming from home and they're not things that were in the schools and when you're talking to the kids and collecting that data so it immediately puts you in in, in, in a frame of how do we marry up the other assets to be able to address those things at home and in the playground or wherever they are so they don't get to the school. And so good point there. Mr. Moody. I was going to say, uh, I know in the past we've partnered with uh, uh, the state police at times, uh, particularly on uh, gang related issues and drug issues. I, I take it that uh, uh, we're still doing that and also uh, with neighboring communities, uh, you, you know, criminals and people who uh, do bad stuff, they don't stick to their own borders a lot. No, they don't. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, they go to where the opportunity is. So uh, I, I don't know how that uh, is manifesting itself, but hopefully, uh, you know, Suffolk, Chesapeake, uh, uh, you know, our, our bordering cities that uh, we, we're cooperating there right. both I think ways. The, I think the chief could speak to that, how the, the regional, how the chiefs across the region are working together. Mr. Mayor, yeah, please. Uh, we, have, are, of course, are on um, 
um, task force. We're part of task force with both federal as well as state and local um, partners. But we've been working well with Chesapeake and our neighboring cities, Norfolk, um, on different issues and crimes. So yes, we are continuing to partner with them, probably more so now than ever before, because like you said, there aren't boundaries um, with crime. So. Right. So Thanks, we're Chief. Together. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Chief, uh, Chief yes. I believe you mentioned um, about, was that the heroin overdoses that you were talking about as far as the, what is it that the police are carrying with them now as a kit? That you um, we don't have it yet. We just had our train-to-trainer -train class, and so we're getting the officers trained, but it's Narcan or Naloxone is what it's called. But it will instantly bring someone back from an heroin, a heroin overdose. So okay. It's a spray. I saw that when I went to National League of Cities last year, and I came back and talked to Dr. both of them about it. Yeah, actually, we've got it funded. And, and um, they, they, they were, it, all across the country, they're using it now, and police, police departments are using it to help bring back uh, victims. Right. So, 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 suppose you spray it, and then and, and, the and, 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 it, and it brings them back. They, they did a, they had the, um, some people from the, actually, I forgot, from the Capitol come over and spoke about it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's interesting. I think it's uh, important, too, as we look at this whole crime, that if you notice that this approach to heroin, it is being handled from a medical perspective, not a criminal perspective. And, and so as we look at this whole issue of crime, the whole marijuana issue is some discussions of decriminalizing that now, um, that we have to look at each of these and not just particular ones because of socioeconomic issues, as these are not just criminal issues, but they are, they are health issues, yes. um, you know, poverty issues yes. that we have to uh, address it holistically. Yeah, a lot, a, lot this, a lot of this is illness. Yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. Okay. Very okay, good. Thank uh, you. Uh, Mayor, members of council, that um, concludes the presentations. However, I'd like to go over, uh, if I may briefly, mm -hmm. um, seven of our items that we have on our um, city manager's request. We have two um, grant awards that are on um, the um, city manager's request for your uh, consideration and approval. We also have an item uh, which is a housekeeping item, which is a code amendment for tree planning and replacement. And this is merely an updating of existing city code, replacing zoning district references from the old code, uh, which predates the 2010 code that was approved, um, and, and aligning the um, correct um, districts that are in our current code and removing the old references of M2 and those kinds of districts that are no longer. So we're just getting the city code aligned with the zoning code with the proper terminology and language. The um, second is that the um, second, the third quarter of the um, um, annual school appropriation is tonight, and that's the $43,290,029 for uh, PPS for the third quarter, and everything is lined at that. Uh, next, I am asking for a withdrawal of the um, item 16. 375, which is in the report, which was um, an adoption of an ordinance to, to amend Chapter 30 of the Code of the City of Portsmouth pertaining to the supplemental retirement system and uh, the Portsmouth Fire and Police Retirement System. Um, and we will bring that back, not as a item separate, but to discuss it during our budget processes as we go forward. Um, and lastly, um, we have 16376, which is the um, budget changes for South Norfolk Jordan Bridge settlement, and they will be coming forward. And um, they, um, if, if you read it, it would probably confuse you as the money coming in and how it goes into one fund. Then once it gets in that fund, it has to be transferred out by finance into another fund just for <coughs> proper record keeping and finally that money is going to go toward um, the um, seawall project to finish that that project out so all of those are the items for your consideration tonight okay, okay. Good. yes sir the the item <coughs> item 16 375 mm -hmm. is is this the issue that we've been going back and forth um, over in regards to the um, 
supplemental pay that the retirees have been before us? No. Is this not no. issue? Yeah, no, HRA? this is totally no. different. No, no this, this is, is different. This is an offset piece. No. Okay. Yeah, this, this was an offset, that uh, which we shared with you two weeks ago, that uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission, when that was back in 2008, and looking at um, um, the, the piece where there was um, financial, um, I guess, piece where the settlement of the 173 million that was placed to write this system, there was a $2,400 supplement that were was available to retirees that uh, would leave and they, they would get that supplement until they were 62 or 65. 62 in fire and police or 65 in PPS. However, m most of these who left the city, as was in the report, were in their 40s, 41, 42, or up to 50-something, and they most of them went on to get <coughs> other jobs. So it was recommended in 2008 that um, the city discontinue it. It would change our liability um, drastically. Right now, our liability is at 98.7 million. Um, it could show a $4 million savings and take us to about 94.2 million and that was the actuary's recommendation. Okay. That's, yes. Yeah. You mentioned the money to the seawall. Yes. I can report with my own eyes. I have the a The Crompton <laughs> Barge has arrived today. <laughs> yeah, I have a brief <laughs> First report because I thought someone, I have two other things quickly. Uh, the, con the, the contract as a seawall replacement project is mobilizing as we speak. And the job trail is on site. It came on site earlier this week. Construction fencing is being installed from Admiral's Landing all the way down to the Renaissance Hotel, which is Area 3. The electrical subcontractor is performing service disconnections, which did affect our Christmas tree. But we've got that back and working, uh, which is ahead of the uh, demolition, demolition, demolition phase. The first of three work barges will arrive between now and the end of the week. This project, um, Area 3, is expected expected to be open prior to July the 4th. Okay. I'd also like to call your attention to very um, um, significant pieces. We are uh, uh, providing information to you in regard to the city of Portsmouth uh, is only one of two cities that received two of Governor's um, announcement of policing in the 21st century um, grant award and um, we um, are very grateful to Chief Chapman and her team for going forward and um, she was funded fully for both of those grants, $20,000 each. The other which I want to call to your attention and that um, came down the pike late yesterday is on yesterday Governor um, McAuliffe announced the awarding of the $939,435 toward a pilot mental health program at the regional jail. As you are aware, the City of Portsmouth Legislative Affairs Manager, Mrs. Sherry Neal, and the Director of Behavioral Health Care Services, Mrs. Elaine Braithwaite, are the two individuals who conceived, developed, and worked with the uh, past and present staff at the Hampton Regional Jail and the Community Service Board members from across the five jurisdictions that are part of the Regional Jail, resulting in the receipt of this enormous grant. We are the only uh, jail and city in the state that received the 900 plus thousand uh, dollars and both Behavioral Health Care Services and um, Mrs. Um, Neal will be the lead in helping to begin the um, development of how they go forward. They are meeting tomorrow. But, um, you know, when it's written, it leaves out the significance of um, this team that put it together. When we heard about this, uh, we had just heard about the issues at the regional jail, and a, a, a city had to go forward to put it work with the team. So um, I assigned that to Mrs. Neal, and from there we were awarded the money. So we are we are quite pleased. Perfect. Okay, thanks, Mayor. Yeah, they, they have a press release that they're putting out. Yes. Uh, for yes. That. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Pace will be putting something out tomorrow. Mr. Moody, uh, we're going over projects, uh, certainly less technical project than the seawall, but uh, I understand the boat ramp is, is uh, up and going. Yes. And how about the uh, pokey 
smoky. Um, the um, boat ramp is up and going, and the um, last update on. So they we're going to test the uh, the track. Right, is Mr. Right here? I knew that there the was going to be testing of the track. Uh, hold on. Oh, Pocky Smoky, here it is, right here. It says that um, HBH Railroad um, is the successful bidder, and it goes on says the work on the track is complete. Once the wheels are replaced by fleet services, so we are actually doing in house uh, a fleet management, Mr. Strickle and his team are um, replacing the wheels. Uh, we will test the train and make track adjustments as necessary. So I will check and let you know by in the morning. Uh, just where they are with that. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Any uh, liaison reports? Okay. Anything else for the good of me? All right. There's no motion for close, so we'll stand adjourned until 7 o'clock and dinner is served. Good. Good. Okay. 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 Okay.